Hello, everybody. My name is Ed Dorrell, and I'm deputy editor of the TES. Could this debate be any more timely? When the TES came together with our friends at Comprehensive Future and the Fair Education Alliance at the beginning of the year to discuss holding such an event, little could we realise what was going to unfold in the following months. And yet, pretty much by luck, I'd like to imagine a bit of skill, but largely by luck, we arrive at a date which is on the eve of the publication of the Conservative Party manifesto, <laughs> which is, uh, we are told, if the polls are to be believed, uh, a document for a uh, government that promises to radically reshape the uh, state of state education, possibly last, since the last reshaping of the state of education. <laughs> Nonetheless, this is the most timely of debates. We're, we're taking, uh, it's taking part, it's taking place on the eve of a really momentous occasion. Are we about to see the rebirth of widespread selective education across the country? And what a panel we have here today to discuss it. <laughs> First of all, already answered. <laughs> it's with some sadness that I have to report Owen Jones, due to unforeseen circumstances, can't make it. But we do have the brilliant Melissa Benn uh, taking his place, for which we are very grateful. So... What a fantastic panel we've got. We have got, in no particular order, Har speaking for the motion, Harriet Sargent. Harriet is a journalist, author, research fellow at the Centre for Policy Studies. She is the author of several books, including Between the Lines, Conversations in South Africa, and Among the Hoods, My Years with a Teenage Gang. Her policy palette is wide-ranging, taking in, as it does, immigration, NHS management, the police, the care system, and, well... Education. Mark Morin, who is here, he is the localism lead at ResPublica, a think tank that has risen to prominence through growing awareness of red Toryism and Philip Blonde's hair. <laughs> For the last 15 years, Mark has contributed widely to research and policy in education, economic development, employment and skills, not least of all, and importantly, authoring ResPublica's controversial report into education in Nosley last year, which recommended the setting up of a grammar school, uh, given Theresa May's recent policy alignment seemingly in the direction of red Toryism. Um, it's really well worth listening to what he's got to say on the subject of grammar schools. Then, also speaking in favour of the motion, we have Peter Hitchens, journalist, author and broadcaster who, I think for most people here, will need little or no introduction. When one of his main, many sparring partners on Twitter accused him earlier this week of being an ex-communist, he was quick to correct them. He is, in fact, an ex-Trotskyist. Which <laughs> things are important. Since then... <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Reported on the teacher union for a number of years. Uh, since then, Peter has been on something of a political journey and has now arrived with his much-discussed column at the Mail on Sunday. He's also a former foreign correspondent in Moscow and Washington and a winner of the Orwell Prize of Journalism, which is nothing to be sniffed at. Speaking against the motion, we have Mary Boosted, who is General Secretary of the Association of Teachers and Lecturers, but will soon be elevated to greatness with the merger of the ATL with the NUT to form the National Education Union, which will be vast. Uh, before her current gig, she was an educator of teachers, a lecturer, a head of a school of education, and before that, most importantly, a real-life teacher. Uh, she is passionate, a passionate campaigner on behalf of state education and one of the best-read and most-loved TES columnists. Lewis Ewu, yeah. read PPE at Oxford, where he was elected president of the Students' Union. Importantly. Uh, he is a big name in debating, a former World University's debating champion. He has coached Hong Kong, UAE and England debating teams, and he is currently director of the Fair Education Alliance, which campaigns uh, with a number of other organisations for educational equality. And last but not least, we have Melissa Benn, who isn't Owen Jones, but is just as fabulous. <laughs> she is an author, a campaigner, a journalist, a, 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 a brilliant, brilliant campaigner for comprehensive education, and she will do fantastically uh, in Owen's place. So, um, before we start, by a show of hands, I would like to ask the audience 
to raise their hands if they are in favour of the motion, which is that the next government should introduce more grammar schools. All those in favour? Ooh. Ooh. More Blimey, it's worth staying. Shall we say that? <laughs> <laughs> more to third? I wasn't expecting that, no. Yes, third? Uh, I'd say a third. Third, okay. And just for the sake of it, those against? Uh, it's more like So, slightly more. Before we move on to the actual debate, uh, the bun fight, as I'm calling it, how about a little academic rigour? Hosted as we are today by the LSE, <coughs> we thought we'd ask one of the fine institution's best known names from education, Sandra McNally, who's going to give us a quick run through of the research context as we understand it. Sandra. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to, to, to come and to give the introductory overview before we get on to the main event and I'm sure the very fine speeches that we'll hear from the panel. So my job is to try to give some facts to inform the discussion that we're going to have rather than give much of an opinion, although it may come through. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> now, what, is a, what are grammar schools? Perhaps we can start with uh, that a definition. Uh, so the distinguishing feature of grammar schools is that uh, students take an entrance exam at age 10 and only those achieving above a certain threshold are admitted. That is what a grammar school is. Maybe people want to redefine it, but that's the common understanding in this country what a grammar school is. It was our educational system throughout England um, in the until the 1960s. Um, then there was a Labour government in 1964 and local education authorities gradually adopted the comprehensive model, but it was done gradually. It was stopped in 1979 with the election of the Conservative government, which is why a small number of local uh, education authorities never changed their system and all of Northern Ireland didn't change its system, so that still has the grammar school selective system in place. <coughs> so the questions we could ask well, first of all, who gets into grammar schools? Because that has implications for segregation by socioeconomic group and potential implications for inequality and social mobility. We can ask, what effects do grammar schools have on the performance of pupils who attend them and those who do not attend them? And finally, what impact does a system of selective education have on educational performance in a country vis-a-vis -vis a more comprehensive system? So to start with the first question, well, there are many studies that look at the income differentials or socioeconomic background of people who attend grammar schools and those who don't attend grammar schools. This is from the DfE recent statistics in this year, just released quite recently. And they show, and it's based on administrative data, um, they show that those attending grammar schools are much less likely to come from poor backgrounds, which is the red bar and the blue bar, than students in other schools, whether they're in the same local authorities or, or elsewhere. So it's just a fact. Poor students mostly don't get into grammar schools. Then the people who are in grammar schools are much more likely to be over the median income in the country. So that's the top 50% of income, that's the green bar in grammar schools relative to other countries. So grammar schools, as we have them at the moment, are catering for people of above average income in the main part and are not catering very more for poor students and it's just a matter of fact, it's not a matter of opinion. <coughs> now, there is a relationship between family income and educational attainment and many studies show this. This is again from the DfE own statistics showing a relationship between how people's so social background, their income, the family income and reaching the expected standard at age 11. So if you have a test at age 10, you're going to discriminate based on family income. It's just going to be related to, amongst other things, um, your family background. And it's a matter of fact. It's in this data, it's in many data sets, it's been widely documented. Um, it's, it's even more strongly, uh, the correlation is stronger in this country compared to other countries in more equal societies. It's not as strongly correlated to your family income and your achievement at age 11, but in this country it's very strongly correlated, has been for many years. So why? Why is there this relationship? Well, there are many studies that look at this. Um, important reasons are that family income tends to be correlated with a better home environment, such as better, better housing, better health care, better early childcare, 
um, parental background, including more highly educated parents. Um, so just a, a better lot, really, for people who come from those backgrounds. Um, and the differences in child development by social group emerge even before children start school. So if you have a test at age 10, you are going to definitely um, discriminate in favour of people who have already had these advantages. So what are the implications for selection by ability? Um, as I said, there's a strong correlation anyway between social background and tests at age 10 or 11. And if you have a system that selects people into schools at age 10, um, you know, you may even have, um, that might be reinforced by private tutoring as well um, from, from families who have higher income. So if large parts of the country are run in this way, the whole education system will be stratified by socioeconomic background in secondary school. Um, inequality is further reinforced if grammar schools receive more resources than other schools, for example, in the form of voluntary donations from parents, which does happen a lot in Northern Ireland. I, I don't know about this country. Now, bear in mind that only about 35 to 40 percent of a typical GCSE cohort go to university, um, and that's very strongly influenced by socioeconomic background as well. So in a selective school system, more schools will have no pupils who go to university, and that has implications for the educational aspirations of pupils, parents, and teachers in such schools. So moving to the next question, what are the potential consequences of grammar schools on student performance? Well, it might be easier to teach students of similar ability. That was one justification for why you put people into different schools at age 10. Um, although you can do that within schools as well, and it's commonly done within schools, people are put in different sets depending on their ability for different subjects. So you don't need to have different school types to get this advantage. On the other hand, schools in non-grammar schools, students in non-grammar schools might lose out from the absence of high ability peers because they're deprived of their, their really good, the clever, really clever people who've, and high income people who've managed to get into the grammar school are not with them and therefore they can't benefit from them. Um, and I suppose the more important, one of the most important issues is the existence of grammar schools might be detrimental to the learning environment of non-grammar schools if it's sufficiently widespread in terms of low aspirations of pupils who do not pass the entry test amongst themselves teachers and parents. So what is the evidence on whether grammar schools have a positive effect for students who actually attend them and what about students who do not attend them? Well it's not straightforward to answer that question because those entering grammar schools are already high performing at age 10 or 11 and may be on a strong, stronger growth path in any case. But the studies that have looked at this carefully suggest, and uh, there aren't that many studies that uh, are very conclusive about this, but not surprisingly, grammar schools do have a positive effect for those who attend them. I'm sorry, one study I cited there is from the English context, another study that I was involved in is from the Northern Irish context. But both studies suggest the possible negative spillovers on other schools as well. What do other countries do? Well, other, lots of countries, some countries track students into different schools at age 10 or 11, um, in, including Austria, Germany, Northern Ireland, and Hungary, though they don't all have a, 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 an exam at age 10. And other countries, including Britain, um, uh, education at this age is comprehensive. But it didn't always, wasn't always the case. Countries used to be more selective than they are, and this sort of comprehensivization happened um, after the Second World War. So we can learn from um, what <coughs> countries did historically by looking over time. So what are the consequences of changing a whole system? Uh, we, the best evidence on this comes from Scandinavia. Um, they reformed their um, system, um, different regions reformed the system at different times. So we can look at cohorts uh, of students born, and after the, born before and after the reforms and make use of the fact that they were introduced, the reforms were introduced at, at different times across different regions. So some students, depending on where they were born, depending on when they were born, are exposed to a more comprehensive system and others are exposed to a more selective system at age 10. And the findings are that they all find average positive average effects of the reforms on educational attainment that were strongly driven for lower socioeconomic groups. So now I've done something similar with my colleague Eric Moran. Uh, for English education, um, we looked at the... Um, we looked at the uh, a national cohort development study, which is a survey of all children born in um, 1950, 
58, and compared them to the, those born in 1970, um, looked at the change in the uh, proportion of students going to grammar schools across different local authorities in England, and plotted that against the change in the age 16 scores between those two, two time periods, and you get a positive correlation. So indicating that, that the change, the improvement in performance comes more strongly from those local authorities where there was a the change made uh, from more selective system to uh, the comprehensive system. Because you have to realise that when you're thinking about this, it's the impact on the non-grammar schools is extremely important. So the overall evidence suggests that selection by ability at age 10 or 11 is strongly socially selective. Um, so if implemented widely, it, is, it, would likely, it would be likely to increase segregation by socioeconomic background, which has implications for social mobility. Um, many existing grammar schools are good schools for those who attend them, but there's a cost to surrounding schools. Um, and that the available evidence suggests that a more comprehensive system is beneficial on average across a whole country and benefits uh, groups disproportionately. So for the education system as a whole, um, the evidence would suggest that um, a more comprehensive system is preferable. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Sandra. So this is how it's going to work. Each of our fabulous uh, panellists is going to get seven minutes to put forward their argument, taking it in turns. Uh, and then we will open up to the audience for a robust debate. And then there will be some closing remarks and then another vote. So without further ado, Peter Hitchens. Good evening. I'm glad to see all of you passed the little selective test we arranged to make sure that uh, not everybody could get in. Uh, and you will have noticed, I imagine, that the, the members of the panel speaking in favour of grammar schools going outside to jeer uh, at the people who couldn't get in and calling them failures, <laughs> uh, which we are always accused of doing and which we never do. That is what is done insistently and incessantly uh, by the opponents of selection viability whose principal task in this debate will be to pretend yet again that there isn't selection already by a rather different route. And that route, let us go quickly through it, that route is through the wealth of parents, which enables them to move into catchment areas uh, where their houses are probably 20% higher than, in price than those of the average in their area. Uh, and through, uh, let us put this politely, perhaps just possibly feigning faith in a religion which they do not believe in uh, for the purposes of gaining entry for their children Two schools which are comprehensive but which are not comprehensive. This is a particular trick adopted by members of the radical left uh, who pretend to believe in comprehensive education but actually believe in schools which are not comprehensive for their own children. The best example of this in London is the London Oratory, a Roman Catholic school, uh, which is as much as uh, very much favoured by the Blair family when they were in power. And the London Oratory. Uh, is as comprehensive as number 10 Downing Street is an inner-city terraced house. <laughs> These points need to be made. Uh, and as one studies the activities of the, uh, of the radical left who rail against grammar schools in London, one finds that they either congregate uh, in the London borough of Camden, for reasons which will become apparent to anybody who studies it, or they become Roman Catholics. <laughs> anyway, that's their solution to the problem, but it's not mine. Uh, I, I, I want to say, to begin with, by the way, that I'm not here to support in any way Mrs. Theresa May, who for many years concealed in her, in her public uh, reference books that she'd even been to a grammar school, or the Conservative Party. Indeed, I take the view of Sir William Harcourt that the Conservative Party has never taken up any cause that it did not betray in the end. Uh, I do not either think that what we need is a piddling, tiny little number of extra grammar schools as a kind of gimmick or sop. What we need is at least 1,500 new grammar schools in England, and when they've proved themselves to be immensely superior to what they replace, I think the Scots will be on along pretty quickly demanding that they have about 150 new ones up there too. Uh, this could easily be achieved. Uh, the revulsion against, uh, against comprehensive education in the former East Germany after the collapse of its communist, uh, its communist regime in 1989 uh, public revulsion and, and, and discontent led to the creation in what had been the German Democratic Republic 
of very large numbers of new gymnasium uh, grammar schools which have been extremely successful, one of which I visited and where I had the great pleasure of attending the English class where the children of dockers and doctors were educated side by side to a standard far higher than you could expect in any state school in this country. And that is really my point. I'm not actually in favour of grammar schools because they increase social mobility, though I believe that they do. I'm in favour of grammar schools because they are good. They are so good uh, that they, what they do is what education is supposed to do in a civilised country, to make sure that the best that has ever been thought, said and written is communicated by this generation to the next reliably, to make sure that the talents of the children of this country, wherever they grow up, however rich their parents are, however prepared to fake faith their parents are, any of those things, the talents of those children are put first and made the greatest possible use of and, 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 and brought to their absolute ultimate perfection by an education system designed to do so. That is what I want to have. But before we get involved in a tedious debate about this, the problems of a tiny rump of besieged grammar schools, almost all of them in wealthy areas, let me first of all do a little bit a little bit of statistical analysis. The problem of, uh, of, of wealthy parents in, um, sending children to grammar schools is undoubted for the reasons I've just described. Most of the grammar schools in poor areas was spitefully closed by Labour councils. Uh, there were a large number of grammar schools were also closed, and I should point this out because I think it was incorrectly stated in, in the opening speech by the professor. They were closed by a, 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 an education secretary called Margaret Hilda Thatcher, uh, who, as far as I know, was a member of the Conservative Party. Between 1970 and 1974, she closed more grammar schools than any Labour government ever did. So it's, it's been a bipartisan vandalism. Anyway, to return to the point, there is the Sutton Trust and, indeed, Teach First have both produced statistics showing that there is a huge dominance of the best comprehensives by the children of the wealthy. Uh, it's 43% uh, it, it of pupils at England's outstanding secondaries are from the wealthiest 20% of families. There is, as I said earlier, a very large premium on house prices in the catchment areas of good comprehensives. The, the pressure on grammar schools, the remaining ones, is huge. Huge numbers of children, twice as many uh, as for comprehensives, uh, travel across local authority boundaries to get to them, so the pressure on them is enormous. If you had as we had before, a national system of grammar schools, reasonably evenly distributed, that would be different. Let me again trouble you with some, some statistics. The Gurney-Dixon report of 1954 recorded that 64.6% of pupils in grammar schools at that time were from working class homes. 64.6%. And I don't think any of you could find a good so-called comprehensive school which has anything <coughs> remotely approaching that figure now. Uh, this, this was confirmed, I, 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 sh I, I should add, by um, Frank Musgrove's book on education on school and the social order. Uh, he also found that apart from the, the children of unskilled workers whose figures were lower, the success in getting two good A-levels back in 1961 among working class peoples at grammar schools was equal to that of, of the professional classes. There is no question but that these schools were fantastically effective in bringing children from poor working class homes into the, the full realisation of their talents. And I, I have to add to this something else which seems to me to be so sad that it, it, really, it, it really needs to be stated because it is such a grief to me and to the country. In 1938-9, private school pupils won 62% of places at Oxford University. In 1958, after some years of, of grammar schools being free to everybody, the private school share was down to 53%. By 1964 to 5, the private school share had fallen again to 45% and was falling so fast that Anthony Sampson, in his fascinating book, The Anatomy of Britain, said at the time that the public schools, if they were to survive, were going to have to emulate the grammar schools. Who put a stop to that? The Labour government of Harold Wilson, which destroyed those grammar schools and did the biggest favour in the name of egalitarian socialism to the private schools that anybody has ever done. It is, the greatest achievement, it is the greatest achievement of egalitarian socialism in this country, in this century, to create and boost and strengthen private education in this country. I'd just like to finish with one small thing. Are you are finishing, I, can see just, just, I think it's very important that I do, because <laughs> you'll be sorry if I don't. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to read out what Eric James, a former high master of Manchester Ground School, said. Uh, when he was trying to defend grammar schools in the House of Lords. 
in 1976. If I were, he said, a high, if I were, he said, a high Tory instead of a Fabian socialist, a Tory of a type that now scarcely exists even in cartoons, one who really believes in privilege and keeping the lower orders down, one of the first things I would do would be to get rid of the grammar schools. That's what they did. Have Melissa Penn, who I will give an extra minute to, <laughs> if you need it. I've got one minute less, actually. Okay. <laughs> we'll balance it out whatever you like. Sorry. Melissa Penn. Um, <laughs> okay, I have to say, this is a sort of nightmare scenario, even for people who are used to speaking. You're not Owen Jones, so half of you are looking really disappointed. You've got half an hour to write your speech at the most important debate on a subject you care passionately about, and you follow Peter Hitchens. <laughs> okay, so I'm really going to do my best. <laughs> um, look, uh, Ed has already mentioned that tomorrow the Conservatives are publishing their manifesto. This election is being shaped as being very much about Brexit, but I think whatever they say about education and about schools in fact, is as, and as important for this country as the European question. We don't know what they're going to say, but they are going to move the clock back. They're going to shift it back. They're going to reshape, as somebody said, once again, we'll have a Conservative-dominated government, if they win, reshaping our educational landscape. And I think this is going to be a disaster. They're moving us back to a system that has been tried and failed. Of course, it won't look the same as the period after 1945, but it may look remarkably similar. Um, and the evidence there, and we did hear it in the opening, which I thought, excellent opening speech. It's all very clear. On the whole, I, th I, I would question Peter Hitchens' figures, and I'm sorry we don't get a chance like discovery in legal cases to get your um, surveys and to question them, but I really doubt that, that figure about 64% of working class children in grammars. Okay, anybody, Most, okay, anybody, so, anybody can Google it. Table J, Gurney Dixon okay, Report, 1954. You, it's on Peter, the internet. Well, you and I are both on Twitter. Let's, let's debate this well, statistical ask. question on Twitter. Because I, 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 I know you've, up, got, you've, got million, you've got millions of male reading followers, and I have a few devoted socialist feminists, but I'll still <laughs> take that debate on with you. Owen Jones on to you because he's got half a million followers. Um, but look, we know, there's two, we know two things about grammar schools and the evidence. We know about the evidence from 45 to the mid-60s. We know that largely it was for the affluent, the professional families. Yes, some working class uh, young people got in. Yes, some lower middle class young people did, and they did very well. That narrative is so well known in our society, we hear it all the time. If you know a man called Andrew Neil, that's all you ever hear about, is how people like that did well through the grammar schools. But do we ever hear about the narrative of those who were sent to the secondary modern? No, we don't. And, no we don't, if you're disagreeing with me, no we don't. We don't hear about it as much. And I read a really interesting figure the other day. Between 1945 and 1976, 20 million plus children were told at the age of 11 that they had failed. And you know, we can talk about statistics, and we can talk about numbers, and if I'd had more time to prepare, I'd have brought a few more. But let's talk about human beings. I've got two children, we were all children ourselves. I think, you make a joke of it about selection coming in the meeting and so on. I think for a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old, particularly from a background where they are not full of confidence, they don't come from a home with books, all the rest of it, to be told that they're an educational failure before they reach adolescence is a disaster for them and a disaster for our country. On a point and of I, information? A point, I mean, this isn't Parliament, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Honourable Member for the Daily Mail wishes to speak. <laughs> she doesn't want it. Okay. I th okay, I'm speaking now. I think it's a disaster. So we know that about the post-war period. What do we know about the existing areas that select? Basically, if we look at Buckinghamshire, if we look at Kent, counties that have kept the same system that we had in the post-war period, and we don't hear enough about that either. They are systems that are cleaved down the middle on the basis of social class. And in Buckinghamshire, they're also divided on ethnic 
uh, grounds as well. It is not a system for social cohesion and it is not a system for the progress of the majority. It is absolutely clear that where you have grammars, those who get into grammars who are largely affluent, only 3% of children on free school meals get into grammars, 16% of children in private primaries do. Um, yes, those children on free school meals do marginally better by an eighth of a GCSE grade than they would have done if they had gone to a good comprehensive. But look at what the impact is of grammars on all the schools surrounding it. It's much harder to recruit teachers, it's much harder to keep the whole morale of the school up because you don't have those who are more high achieving or more highly motivated, and you, it's just a completely two-tier system. It does not make sense. What else do we know about the grammars? We know that the test is flawed. Education Data Lab did some research that came out last week that showed that often if you take the test on a Monday, you might pass. If you take the test on a Wednesday, you might fail. That's not a very good system. We know that it's absolutely about social background and the kind of place you come from. We know it's subject to tutoring. In Birmingham, parents on the whole pay £5,000 to tutor their children to take the 11 plus. We don't know if all of those children succeed. Um, we know it harms disadvantaged children and we know it harms surrounding schools. And it creates in parents, even those parents who succeed or children who succeed, there's a kind of anxiety around the whole, whole process which I think is antithetical to education and antithetical to human growth, development and flourishing. And let's talk about education in those terms rather than, oh no, one minute, help. Okay, I thought you were gonna give me two minutes actually. Um, I have two, Melissa. Okay, so what do we know? We know as our opening speaker said, that comprehensive it, that the Europe and beyond is moving towards a comprehensive system, a non-selective system, and they are doing very well. We often talk about Finland. Finland had a system like ours. It moved to comprehensive education. It's top of the league tables. What do we also know? It's provided opportunity for millions. One of the things about this debate is it's all about Oxford and, Cam Oxford and Cambridge, and Peter proved that that's the kind of way it's framed. How many people go into Oxford and Cambridge? But what about all those people who go to a comprehensive and they learn how to love to learn, and they go on and they do, you know, they feel that their educational uh, adventure is beginning, not that they started as failures and it's closed down. I think that's a very important point. The Conservative Party actually agree with us because before Theresa May and two of her advisers, perhaps only one of her advisers, decided that going setting the clock back was a good idea, Michael Gove, David Cameron, not my sort of people generally politically, they actually saw that the answer was good schools for all. And I'm sorry to see that part of them go. And we know it's better for social cohesion. Of course, comprehensive education has to be well funded. It needs good teachers. It needs leadership. It needs a modern approach to the curriculum. And London is a good example of what well-supported, collaborative comprehensives can do. High expectations, fantastically important. So this policy was written, I think, on the back of a pret a manger envelope. I really do. And now Theresa May, who's a stubborn woman, is holding on to it. Everybody in the educational world is against it, from the former chief inspector of schools through to the head of the Institute of Education and UCL, every teaching union, heads around the country. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it except Peter Hitchens, Theresa May, <laughs> and Nick Timothy. Oh, and I, I don't mean to be rude to the other speakers because they want it as well, because they're here. <laughs> so I think this is a... I think this is a quick fix instead of the hard slog that we need to make our schools good for everyone. And I don't deny that it is a huge challenge. Please, please, don't support this and don't vote for a government that wants to bring it in. <laughs> Half an hour's notice. Anyway, Sorry. next up, Harriet Sargent. Uh, we've heard that apparently that uh, everyone hates uh, grammar schools, but May is introducing grammar schools because she knows they're actually really popular with parents. Uh, why are they popular? The idea of grammar schools conjures up an image of children in neat uniforms working hard in a disciplined, organised environment, with the teacher as a figure of authority and respect. 
Interestingly, the biggest fans of grammar schools are ethnic minorities. At some, 90% of pupils are drawn from ethnic minorities. Uh, at the King Edward Grammar Schools, for example, 65% uh, have an Asian background. They value hard work, discipline, and aspiration. They're not interested in ideological, educational wars. They want their children to su succeed. And it's clear they equate success with grammar schools and not with comprehensives. This debate is actually about two different educational cultures, two different teaching methods. I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educationalist. I did, however, write a think tank report on why black Caribbean and white working <coughs> class boys fail. I spent a year interviewing these boys, their parents, going into schools, uh, talking to teachers and heads. Parents and children that I talked to complained about violent schools, lack of discipline, lack of aspiration, and teaching methods that fail to teach even the basics. Most of our, the boys I interviewed were barely literate. They are not alone. A third of boys on free school meals at the age of 14 have a reading age of below 11. <coughs> According to The Guardian, 20% of the adult population is functionally illiterate, and a third cannot add up two three-figure numbers. So how have such a large proportion of our poorest pupils passed through 11 years of edu state education and still don't have the basics? The answer can be found in the progressive methods which have dominated our state schools for decades, an outlook which is renounces vigour, dismisses knowledge and traditional teaching as completely futile, and refuses to challenge children with anything might, that might bore them or prove irrelevant. The parents I interviewed were bitter that they had no say on how their children were taught. They laid their blame for their children's poor education squarely on these sort of ditzy methods which they complained about. Far from being the motor for social mobility as grammar schools have proved to be, our state school system pointed out one form ahead of Ofsted is entrenching deprivation and social immobility, while another described the attainment gap between pupils in secondary schools as quote, an appalling injustice, an inexcusable waste of potential, and a reproach to us all. Why I believe traditional is better than progressive is simple. One works, the other doesn't. As I have seen with the South London gang that I befriended seven years ago, <laughs> I know, it's unlikely, but I did. <laughs> These boys, I mean, when I first met them, they were bright, they were ambitious, they really wanted to succeed. Uh, at 15, they told me, you know, they wanted to join a, a, a golf club and live in the suburbs. It's the same ambition as most of our sons have. <laughs> mm. But the really sad thing about this is no one had ever made them sit down and apply themselves. It meant they never learned to turn a kind of burst of enthusiasm into the day-to-day -gr grind that we all know brings success. They failed, uh, that, that failing was a serious consequence for them and society. Barely able to read, they dropped out of school at 14. As one said to me, you lot graduate from school to university, we go from school to prison. Uh, it actually does not have to be like that. I visited charter schools in New York and a free school here in Brent who proudly employ those traditional methods of ed education we associate with grammar schools on poor inner city children. In the free school, an 11-year-old Iranian boy told me he'd learnt the whole of the ancient mariner by heart. He began to recite it with gusto. He did not seem particularly academic to me, but learning that poem <laughs> had taught him application, self-discipline, and confidence. 
These are values people equate with the middle classes and grammar schools, but they don't have to be. They can be learned by anyone, anywhere. But they do need an educational establishment convinced of their importance. The tragedy is too many comprehensives are failing to teach them and for purely ideological reasons. The argument against grammar schools is too many lose out for the few to succeed. How is that any different from the present? Grammar schools are selected by intellectual ability. The top 500 are performing comprehensives select by those who can afford to pay for a house closest to them, as we were discussing. Uh, they have, I mean, the, uh, uh, One minute, the have half as many pupils on free school meals and the average comprehensive, um, so that there's just 9% of pupils on free school meals in the top 500 comprehensives. So selection is alive and thriving in the state sector, and it's by money rather than academic ability. I believe May's version of grammar schools is addressing a lot of the problems that people have with them. Uh, May said that she'll force grammar schools to take a quota of children on free school meals and allow late developers to take exams at 14 and 16. At least with her proposals, some bright children from a poor background might get a chance at a decent education. At the moment, too many gifted children are neglected by their schools or treated with suspicion for fear, as one teacher said, of being branded elitist. Are you winding up? We're nearly there, okay. Sorry, I've got to jump. So people like grammar schools because they offer a traditional form of teaching and they, uh, the, the traditional form of teaching is because it succeeds where progressive education fails. That failure has hit our poorest kids the hardest. Their parents can't afford to live near good schools and they can't afford to employ tutors. So I think grammar schools are a great idea, but an even better idea is if we make, as the question has asked us, grammar schools work for everyone. That is, if we take their traditional methods that have been so successful in grammar schools Harry, and use you, uh... them in all schools and on all abilities of children. And that way, we could uh, right. we make sure that up. I've got one last line, one, one last, last line, line. Okay. and then I'm stopping. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that way, we would make sure that all schools provided, as one, children, one child wrote on the notice board of a charter school in Harlem in New York, that education should be a journey to one of the best lives out there. And now Mary Boosted. 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 I'm sorry. Right. So, okay. I've only known you for ten years. I know. I know. It's a common mistake. I, I have got a speech written, but the last speaker made me so cross, so angry, <laughs> that I'm now going to just depart from my speech. <laughs> what we got there was a right-wing rant about the standards of education in our country, completely unevidenced or evidence-based on one or two free schools and charter schools and a few interviews with the Black Boys 10 years ago. We, we, got a, we got a rant. No. No, 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 no. I'm speaking now. We got a rant. We got a rant about poor standards, about progressive education, and we got a slating of the schools in our country. It is not true. No, no. And no. <laughs> it is. I'm to make a point of order. I do not think speakers should, should, should engage in personal attacks on the speaker. Thank you. I feel comment. I feel personally attacked by the portrayal of teachers and schools that the previous speaker did. I think it was disgraceful. The fact of the matter is, what about the fact of the is educational standards in this country are rising, and the fact of the matter is that it is comprehensive schools which have been the force for those rising of educational standards. Now, what both speakers have tried to prove and tried to put is a, is a fairy tale world 
where you have grammar schools which will educate and provide educational standards for the few, not the many. They've said that grammar schools are a force for working class children to succeed. Now, I know about grammar schools because when my daughter was a 10, we moved from, Kinks, uh, we moved from Yorkshire to Kingston-upon-Thames, and I took her to a new school, age 10, at St. Luke's Primary School in Kingston. Went to the school, dropped her off, came back, and as I got to the school gate, I was met by two other mothers, very nice, talking to me about schools, and immediately they said, right, she'll be taking her 11-plus <coughs> test in 10 months' time, when she'll be 10, 10 years, 10 months. These are the tutors, and you've got to go and get a tutor for the test. And when I found out, um, I said, well, I'm not going to do that. They said, well, you know, if, if, if the money's a problem, you know, we can, we, we can do, so, we, we, can, uh, we can give you her books and we can give you her um, uh, uh, work second hand. I, I, needless to say, I refused to take them up on their offer. Now, proponents of grammar schools know that coaching is a fundamental problem for their, uh, for their argument that grammar schools promote social mobility. So they try to get around this by saying, well, we're going to, in the future, with more grammar schools, devise a test which can't be coached for. The fact that such a test has never existed, the fact that Buckinghamshire decided that would, they have a new test which can't be coached for, and they found that actually it was more susceptible to coaching, <laughs> or Kent... Kent, a research report last week, found that um, the 11 plus test was a loaded dice and the dice is loaded against poor children. There is no evidence, there is no evidence that grammar schools provide a route for... Thank you. want to know. There is no evidence that grammar schools provide a route for poor children to achieve better life chances. In two-thirds of grammar schools, the proportion of poor children is less than 3%. And even when poor children achieve level 5 at SATs, the 7% of poor children who achieve very well at school, when they achieve a level 5, less than 2.5% of them get into a grammar school. And that shows that you don't have selection by ability, you have selection by the ability to pay. In Kent... Children from low-income families, almost all, are educated in secondary modern schools, and they do worse than everywhere else in the country. But the effects of segregation don't stop at the end of school. In Kent, the average hourly wage difference between the highest earners and the lowest earners is four pounds more than in schools uh, than in areas which have non-segregated schooling. And nor is there any evidence that grammar schools have ever been a vehicle for social mobility. Even in their heyday, in the 50s and the 60s, a pitiful 0.3 percent of grammar school pupils with two A-levels were from the skilled working class. The post-war spike in social mobility was, met, was created by a very large and very rapid increase in changes in the labour market. Quite simply, the, well, the new welfare state needed more teachers, more technicians and more nurses. Now, our two proponents of the grammar school system have argued that there's already selection by the back door through house code and through a postcode lottery. Get your house in the right area with the right school. If they are serious about that, they should argue for the expansion of school catchment areas, the allocation of places to oversubscribe schools by a lottery or by a fair banding system, and by stopping schools running their own admissions authorities and returning the authority to local, local authorities who could uh, enforce a fair playing field. Now, Theresa May seeks to get around these um, objections with a load of Orwellian doublespeak accusing the opposition to grammar schools of dogma, and she should look in the mirror here. And in the name of choice, she argues that an increase in selection is part of her drive for the fight for just about managing. She also seeks to sweeten the pill by saying there'll be quotas of poor children in grammar schools. And already, the right wing of her party, Graham Brady, is saying he doesn't like that. That's directed him as social engineering. I don't think she'll get that policy through. But if we really want to achieve social mobility, rather than increasing selection at 11, we should do one thing. We should fight child poverty so that fewer pupils arrive at <coughs> primary school already far behind their more advantaged peers. About 40% of the gap in attainment between advantaged and disadvantaged pupils emerges before the children start school. At the age of 11, when the test is taken, it's a gap of almost 60%. That's equivalent to 10 months of learning at this stage. And years of research have shown that children do best in schools with mixed intakes, where children of different social classes 
different cultures and different dispositions learn not just from their teachers Mary, you've got but one from minute. each other. One minute. Children do not make linear progress. Those who are falling behind academically, age 10, can, a few years later, transform their academic problems. But the worst thing that any education system can do is to tell a child, age 11, that they are not worthy of a place in a prestigious school and that their life's ambitions must be circumscribed by their failure on one day to pass a test which many of them, those without the parents with the means to buy coaching, were prepared for. And now we've got Mark. And now Mark. Jesus. Uh... <laughs> Is it too late to respect the picket? <laughs> I mean, as the very excellent introduction made clear, grammar schools in England are emphatically not engines of social mobility. Put simply, too few pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds attend grammar schools to have any kind of transformational effect. But where disadvantaged pupils do attend grammar schools, and this is a key fact that is indisputable, they achieve 10 percentage points higher than they would in the comprehensive system. So high achieving pupils age 11 achieve GCSE 10 percentage points higher than they would have done if they got stayed in the comprehensive system. Now we know that disadvantaged pupils are less likely to attend grammar schools for points that have been already been raised, they've fallen behind by 11, they're not supported in school to pass the 11 plus, they're less likely to be privately tutored. But for those opposed to selection, the issue is not just a matter of better or equal access. One of the key arguments, which has again already been made, is the negative effects of the two-tier system that privileges an academic elite and abandons the rest to a second-rate education. And the key evidence to support this comes from the places where grammar schools are currently operating, where pupils are faring worse than their counterparts in non-selective areas. But crucially, selective areas, Buckinghamshire, Kent, Lincolnshire, and so forth, do not represent the most deprived areas in England, where disadvantaged pupils make up a larger share of the total cohort. The counter evidence is that disadvantaged pupils perform less well where they are a minority. And this could be the case in those aforementioned counties, with or without grammar schools. In fact, I would argue against academic selection in places like Kent and Surrey and Bucks, where they're not particularly adding any value and where they don't particularly benefit the middle classes. The comprehensive system takes children of all abilities from a particular place and educates them together in one school. That's the basic premise of the comprehensive system. It's a one-size-fits-all approach that purports to lift all equally. Now, evidently, we have some serious fundamental structural problems ongoing, lasting many generations with our comprehensive system. The system is grounded in place with a tendency towards a two-tier effect Good schools in prosperous areas, bad schools in poor areas. The large majority of local authorities performing below the national average are within the bottom 25% of the most deprived authorities and all have a comprehensive education system. These include authorities like Liverpool, Manchester, Bradford, Middlesbrough, Hull, all across the north of England. They include Sandwell, Wolverhampton, Nottingham and Leicester in the Midlands. And there are many others. Many of these areas have been failing for a long time. Like I say, it's generational. Long before austerity measures began to take effect and despite significant investment under Labour's watch. And many of these area areas are also amongst the 20 places identified by the Southern Trust as having high levels of missing talent, by which this means people Pupils who score in the top 10% nationally at age 11 will fail to achieve in the top 25% at GCSE. Mm. They simply just go missing. Some of these schools are failing pupils of all ability comprehensively. 
Now, London, as again it's been mentioned already, is commonly cited as the great educational success story, <coughs> which, which, other, excuse me, which other places can learn from. But London is different to other parts of the country in many ways, economically, socially, culturally. It is a place where poverty and wealth coexist cheek by jowl, where a family in temporary accommodation can literally live next door to a family that own a million pound house, and where the children of those two families can attend the same school. This is not the kind of social and economic mix that is easily found elsewhere. These kind of debates in favour of comprehensive schools tend to be dominated by the metropolitan liberal elite, and they tend to view the system and the world through London's experience. And if you go and take a trip around some of those places I've mentioned, you'll find that it's very different. Now, previously, I've argued that incremental gains can be achieved in our underperforming schools using the system that we already have. And part of the solution will be a fairer funding formula for schools in disadvantaged areas and incentives such as a teaching premium to attract the best teaching talent. But this is not sufficient to bring about the level of transformational change that's needed. So a new model of academic excellence is required since our most disadvantaged areas need excellence just to be average. And this is ever more the case given the impact of Brexit and globalisation, the widening regional disparity in the UK's economy and the speed and the breadth of the rise of inequalities in our society. I've argued that grammar schools can play a vital role as part of a whole system, a whole area transformation. I think that grammar schools can act as a catalyst for long-term cultural change, providing a model of excellence which can influence practice in other local institutions at secondary and primary level, and across the different types of schools that excel in different capabilities, academic, technical, creative, not a one-size-fits-all, not one favouring good, others bad. Ensuring parity of esteem by not off-rolling less academic pupils to substandard secondary or vocational provision and helping to raise outcomes for all pupils in every part of the system. But this would require an approach that ensures selection is not in itself harmful and I have a lot of sympathy for, for some of the arguments against the damaging effects of pupils taking the 11 plus ending up in a, in, in a second rate school, failing and, and being traumatised um, uh, thereafter. So what I'm calling for is a form of academic selection in disadvantaged areas where there are no or too few outstanding or good schools and where attainment is persistently poor. And this would require some kind of tutor-proof selection system. For example, grading children according to schools report. Well, you've got one minute. Okay, thank you. As originally conceived in the Butler Act. Support for primary schools to prefer children for an entrance exam. A quota system for children from poorer backgrounds before places are offered more widely. And ways of transitioning late developing pupils into a selective school at a later stage, given that you know, many are late developers. So, to sum up, and in my view, grammar schools can, under a restricted set of circumstances, so I'm not part of the crazier side of the debate, but I do nevertheless kind of support and advocate a role for grammar schools. They can be the right vehicle to raise the quality of an area's education provision and deliver real social value to working class areas around the country. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Lewis. Great. Um, it's telling that in Peter's speech, almost all the examples were drawn from the 1930s, the 1950s, the 1960s, and East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, Peter, the world has moved on, <coughs> would you believe? The internet was invented since then. Politicians are now endorsed by grime artists. And shock horror, believe it or not, there are some comprehensive schools in this country that help poor kids become doctors, CEOs of tech companies, Guardian columnists, LSE students, and secure the best apprenticeships the nation 
has to offer. It is quite offensive to argue this case, this, this debate, as if we were 45 years ago, as opposed to today, where comprehensive schools deliver excellence, Mr Speaker. I am going to sum up the logic of the case that we heard from our opponents. The logic is basically this. There are some parents who rigged the system for admissions, therefore what we should do is we should spend the state's money, time and effort to help a few more parents play and rig the system. <laughs> as, opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to an alternative which basically acknowledges that some parents game the system, but how about we take that money, millions, the effort, energy and political capital, and help improve all schools so that you don't have an incentive to try yeah. and game the system. That's a contrast <coughs> between the two sides in this debate today. I'm going to ask three questions to which the answers are all no. One, <laughs> are grammar schools necessary to create a world-class system? Surprise, surprise, we think not. Can we have grammar schools without significant social costs? The answer is no. And finally, do kids have a fair shot at winning this particular lottery? We're going to say the case is simply on our side, on that one. Mm. So first of all, are grammars necessary? We had a characterisation from our opponents that basically portrayed schools which are comprehensive, as schools with no discipline, mm. teachers are running abandoned, there are kids running around waving knives in the air, <laughs> being members of gangs, right? Funny enough, I don't remember that being the case when I was at school in the city, <laughs> London. But more crucially, ladies and gentlemen, that ignores the context of education in this country, which, believe it or not, has improved drastically in the last 20 years. Today, six out of 10 students get the GCSE benchmark. 20 years ago, it was one in five. More disadvantaged kids from poor families go to university, particularly universities like this one, compared to 20 years ago. The characterization that comprehensive schools and the state of education in this country is so dire is absolutely awful. Of course, we need to do better. We need to continue to do things like invest in teachers, invest in leadership, invest in extracurricular activities, invest in business links between schools and, and the corporate world. And yes, some people might struggle, but a solution, by the way, isn't to say to someone, you're struggling, I'm going to send you to a grammar school. By the way, they're probably not going to get to a grammar school under your criteria. The solution is to give that person a mentor or to get that person in front of someone who can actually help them realise their aspirations. We simply don't think this is a necessary condition. I want to tell you the story about a young kid who went to school in Hackney. He learned how to read relatively late. He came from an immigrant family. His school introduced a debating club and he took part in that debating club and within a few years he was the world school's debating champion in an activity <laughs> that is dominated by private schools. He's now on the verge, he's about to start next year, going to UCL. In fact, his Jackson teacher Washington. is mental, sitting in the audience. That story is replicated across the country, ladies and gentlemen. I refuse to believe that comprehensive schools cannot be schools where discipline prevails, cannot be schools where you raise people's aspiration, and schools where you send people to the very best universities, apprenticeships and jobs. It's an absolute fallacy. Let's second of all look at this issue of can you have grammar schools without the significant social costs. My teammates made a very clear argument today that grammar schools negatively affect the schools in that area. They, they monopolise teachers, leaders in that particular area and also, more crucially, there's an effect, a signalling effect that you have when you say to people that you are a failure aged 11. Rare Recruitment published last week a study which showed that kids who go to, kids who don't get into grammar schools are less likely to apply to university <coughs> than kids, the equivalent kids in schools uh, where there are no grammar schools, right? It's not that obvious, I mean, it's not that difficult to understand, right? If you have a label put on you at yet age 11, that there are jobs, there's a whole world cut off from you because you fall into a particular box, I'm sure that's going to have an effect on whether or not you think you should take your place at university or some of the leading jobs in our country or leading apprenticeships. Moreover, what about employment, ladies and gentlemen? It's interesting that we had free speeches, but we never actually heard what would go on in these secondary models. What are you going to teach kids in selective schools that you don't teach kids in non-selective schools or secondary models? In a globalised economy, in an economy where jobs are going to become more automated, I worry for the kids who don't get in to these grammar schools. What on earth are you going to do if you don't have a well-rounded, which includes an academic uh, uh, education, in the schools which aren't selected? Point they need to answer that question. Do you, know what? do you know what? For the spirit of this debate, I'm going to say yes. Go ahead. Oh, good. <laughs> Bring it on. You mentioned, you mentioned secondary modern. 
Now, in current exam performance, and before somebody tells me I've made this up, this comes from the House of Commons library briefing paper on grammar schools published this year. Oh, yeah, Peter. The percentages achieving five or more GCSEs at A star to C grade, including English and maths, were as follows. Secondary modern, 49.7%. Comprehensives and private schools, 56.7%. Uh, no, I didn't know there's a limit on points of information. Comprehensives, 56.7%. Grammar schools, 96.7%. So in 50 years of destruction of grammar schools, we've achieved a 7% alteration in the outcomes of children. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. I've made my point of information. You can stop interrupting me. Peter, Peter, the general point is this. No one's denying that some grammar schools do really well. The problem is they have a negative effect on areas around them. The question is, is it a necessary condition Right, well, of having a world-class education system, that you have grammar schools. It's not. There are plenty of countries in the world which get great results and also have a completely comprehensive system. And we've named some of them, like Canada. And if all the world was a bit more like Canada, the world would be a nicer place. <laughs> let me let just me move on to my last point about uh, do kids have a poor, uh, do kids have a fair shot at getting in? The answer to this is no. We heard from the last speaker that you can set tutor-proof exams. Well, why then did the chief exec of one of the largest uh, companies that provides these tests admit that you can't create a tutor-proof exam. It's absurd that you can Maybe do Maybe because so. he was wrong. And, and, and the fact that you have parents... Well, it's his job. It's, his, it's kind of his job. And the, the fact to be that wrong. parents are spending thousands and thousands of pounds, well, there's a perception that you have to spend thousands and thousands of pounds on getting your kid into a grammar school means that you drive parents either into destitution Lewis, or parents don't seconds. simply apply at all because they think the game is rigged. And what about special kids with special educational needs, who they haven't mentioned if they want these schools to work for everyone, right? There are 1.8% of the population in schools qualifies having special educational needs. The number of those kids in grammar schools today, 0.1%. I have a theory that those kids aren't going to get in. And there are people in this audience who have siblings or children, or will have siblings or children, who might have special needs. You have to ask yourself the question, Will they benefit from this policy? I think not. The last thought I want to have... Lewis, today, Lewis, Lewis just no, 15 no, no, seconds. No, 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 just la last, last, last point is this. Our country is pretty divided. I don't think it's a good idea for us to entrench a policy which will literally divide communities, and not just at school, but beyond. Three questions. Do any grammar schools have a world-class system? No. Do grammar schools come with huge social costs? They do. And finally, do most kids have a fair shot at getting into these schools? And the answer is no. And for all those reasons, vote for our side. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And now the lively bit. <laughs> uh, hands up, please. Hello. Um, so, first of all, to the opposition. Short and sweet, by the way. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, to the opposition, I was wondering, you stated that it's, uh, the testing procedures are unfair because they're slanted towards the rich. However, surely, if you have an advantage coming in by being rich and moving into the area and uh, can use your wealth to directly get into a school, that is even more unfair. So, it is unlikely that you are going to make the system less fair by having more. Um, uh, uh, people that can game a system where you still have some chance of getting through through testing. Secondly, to the proposition, mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, as we were told by the uh, impartial lady at the beginning, uh, who was almost BBC-like in her impartiality, um, <laughs> but um, uh, they're the host. We have we can't anything about it. Uh, that uh, it is clear that what you're talking about to a grammar school is that you have a separate institution, different facilities, different teachers, uh, etc. Uh, why do you think that that is beneficial to a streaming system within schools where you don't have that separation of students? Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to ask you guys to nominate one or possibly two of you to respond. Yeah. Right, to the question about postcode lottery for schools, it's absolutely clear this is a massive problem. But I did address it in my speech. I think there are three things you can do. You can, uh, you can put admissions back to a local authority to ensure that you have a fair system. Because at the moment, academies and free schools are their own admissions system. And that does create game playing. There are schools, there are academies and free schools, which do 
play the system to get an advantage intake. That should not be the case, and they should ha the, uh, the admission should be by the local authority. Secondly, there are ways that you can deal with that. You could have uh, a lottery system to get into schools. You could have a banding system, which has a fair banding of, school of children from different abilities. So if there was a political will to do that, it absolutely could be done, and it should be done. There should not be a postcode advantage for uh, schools and actually if that was the case and we had more schools with more mixed intakes then the whole education <coughs> system would rise the results would rise for the whole of our education system can i, can I and melissa a quick point? one quick so point because it's the one thing i agree with peter hitchens about and i think we ought to have a, a feeling of harmony in the room <laughs> which, oh. is, which is about faith schools and I think everybody recognises that certain faith schools, not all, because some are genuine, some um, denominations run genuinely comprehensive schools, but there are certain elite faith schools where faith is used as a proxy for social class. And, w and those of us on this side, we've been arguing about that for a long time. So, you know, we don't think the answer is to bring in... Um, selection by ability, we do think you should deal with the unfairness of faith admissions, where you, the ridiculously complicated questions about flower arranging and knowing the vicar <laughs> and going to church even though you're not religious is used as a way of getting a safe education for the relatively affluent. Right, and for your side, who would like to speak first? Not me. Okay. Um, so Unsurprisingly, it's Peter. The question of, question of st streaming or setting within schools as opposed to having separate schools... It's fundamentally a question of size, in my view, and of, uh, therefore of ethos and of discipline. I was at a very good comprehensive in southeast London on the borders of a, of a selective area a few months ago, and this school, I won't name it in case it gets into trouble, was running uh, a, what it called effectively a grammar, a, a grammar section within the school, which was attempting to do this. The results were good by comparison with the rest of the school, but they were not anything like as good as the results being obtained by grammar schools across the border. I think the reason this is most comprehensive schools because to be a comprehensive school with a sixth form, you have to have a very large intake, are extremely hard to control. There are a few genius charismatic heads who can actually uh, achieve that level of order and discipline and, and ethos. There are not, they're not universal and they often leave. Grammar schools, by the nature of their size, by the fact that they have this particular ethos, can do this more successfully. And they, they, they were, when we had lots of them, extremely successful. There are huge numbers, for instance, now fellows of the Royal Society who attended grammar schools. Uh, very, very few who attended comprehensive schools. And I think there is a reason for this. And one can look down the list of other of, of, of major cultural achievers in our country in the same way. If those people had to go to comprehensive schools in the, in the, in the 50s and early 60s instead of to grammar schools, we'd never have heard of them. And Harriet or Mark, do you want to come in or shall I open it up? Open it up. Okay, more questions. We're going to go straight to the front because that's just weird. Yes, please. I will go. Okay, there okay, you go. Well, we'll children, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear from you. I haven't nominated you. Okay, well, I'm just saying. Okay, thank children you. Children have been excluded from this debate. They haven't. We've had, they've had their set. No, we've mentioned no, the same. No, it's really important because what's right, what I'm waiting for. You just asked your question. Hi. Hi, Alex. Uh, from this debate <laughs> for too long. Thank you very much. No, okay. Uh, what they get is disabled children. Quiet, are disabled children. Yeah. No, right, uh, Alex. Without hearing the word disabled children, and therefore out of inclusion and inclusion, which is what this debate's about, we've got to ensure that there is space given to all the disabled people' perspective on grammar. Okay. Uh, we will. We will answer your question if you say that. Okay, uh, Alex Ward, uh, owner of an Ofsted Outstanding uh, Nursery. Uh, a question that has been missed by all six of you. On retention and recruitment, to get a good school, you need great teachers. Would grammar schools stop some teachers moving into the private sector and moving out of the sector totally to both sides of the debate? Yeah, I think... I think I'm, I'm going to put it to these guys first because okay. you went first last time. Yeah. Um, Harriet or Mark? Well, I, I would say um, simply that good wages um, would attract, attract good teachers into the kind of areas that, that I'm, I'm advocating. So, you know, I think a grammar school could be that kind of magnet that would attract in the kind of uh, excellence 
that some of these areas that I am speaking to uh, desperately need. Well, I would have thought, I mean, I know uh, quite a lot of young people who've done Teach First and that they have dropped out because of the difficulty of, of keeping discipline in schools and they get no backing from the school, from their heads, uh, and they don't seem to learn very much about it going through teacher training. And I would have imagined that they would have found it much more attractive to work in a school where there is a lot of discipline. But what happens, okay, Lewis, just, Lewis, just, just quick and it would be what you. happens for the kids who don't get into those schools, right? I mean, if, if, if the theory of your, if the theory of that, behind that argument is, um, grammar schools are great, grammar schools are great because we can attract brilliant teachers into those grammar schools, what about the schools which aren't grammar schools? And I think there's been a real lack of I understanding. Think I could actually right, cover right. that in, in well, my thing. I think that we should be having the ethos that we find in grammar schools in all schools. Well, but unfortunately, yeah. the teaching establishment <coughs> refuses to. Think well, you about see, that. you see, I, I got it in the neck because I, I was apparently rude to my previous speaker. Every time she uppers, she's rude about teachers and the teaching establishment. And 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 the. <laughs> The, the onslaught, the onslaught I can say a lot about teachers if you like, but I haven't so far. Well, well, you have said a lot about teachers. Let me just say something about teachers. Uh, it, it is the case now that one in... No, it is the case now in England that we've got a real problem with teachers, that 52% of the teaching profession have less than 10 years' experience. We, we recruit teachers, we spend £700 million a year recruiting them, and then we face them with 55 to 60 hour working weeks, we give them a seven year pay freeze, we give them a massive stress in their work, we give them no respect and then they leave. The, the issue about um, teacher retention is a massive issue. It's more of a massive issue in selective areas where the uh, non-selective schools, the secondary moderns, find it much more difficult to recruit teachers, to retain them, and particularly teachers in the core subjects. So if you're in a secondary modern school, not only are you told at a, a 10 that you're failing, but you're more likely to have teachers who are not qualified in the subject that you are, um, that, that, that you're being taught. They're more likely to be teaching out of a subject, and you're more likely to see teacher turnover, and uh, it's going to be more difficult to staff those schools and more difficult to keep um, mm. teachers in them. So the children who most need the best teaching are less likely to get it in selective areas. Right, can I have another question, please? Uh, I will take... The guy in the bow tie. It's you know it's a trick in a debate. Wear a bow tie. You get asked the question. Yeah. Very good. I'm a primary school teacher and I teach children with additional needs. I'd like to ask where you see children with special edu educational needs fitting into grammar schools as a model. Peter. I, I have no idea. I I, I didn't. I didn't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. No. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I can't. I, I can't, I can't answer a question to which I don't know the answer. Well, I, I, I can say something I just, about this, because I think, actually, I think it's disgraceful that so many kids are labelled with the sense, special educational label needs, when actually it's simply because no one's actually taught them to read and write. Uh, and the only way that the school can get help... The only way that the school, um, sorry, the only way that the school can, can get funding, right, quiet, please. the only no, way I, the school can get funding to get those kids help is by labelling the special educational needs. Okay. Well, if you if I could if, I, if you well, could just, no, 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 if you could just excuse me, I was in the middle of offering. Okay, all right, never mind. I, I'm perfectly happy not to speak if you don't want me to. If, that, if, 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 if the idea is that the people on the platform aren't supposed to speak, then I'm, I can happily sit back and, and enjoy that and not say another word. My point, the point that I was making is this is not what this debate is about. This debate is about whether we should reintroduce academic selection. It is nothing to do. It is nothing. It is nothing. It is nothing to do. It is nothing to do with the question of special needs. Well, 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 you're making. You're, you're making. You're making an assumption there, Peter. You're making an assumption there that children with special educational needs, ipso facto, de facto, are not academically able. I'm not making that. I'm that not is making, not. That, that is an issue here. I'm, not making, I'm simply making no assumptions at all. I'm saying this is a subject of which I do not know anything and don't profess to know anything, so I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> all right, let's move on, please. Uh, there's a lady in a red scarf over there. Thank you. 
First of all, I'd like to personally invite Harriet Sargent to come and I will take you to some schools in Hackney and Tower Hamlets mm -hmm. just to tell you what the real world is like. <laughs> I would love to do that. So the point that I'd I would like love to, to make, do that, and I have actually been to some, but I would really like yeah, to do that. Yeah, because okay. question, please. The point that I'd, I'd like to make, and the question I'd like to ask hmm. is: Do people that advocate grammar schools actually hmm. understand what grammar schools are? Because you get suggestions, for instance, that you're going to have quotas of poor children, or you're going to put the grammar school in a particular area, which seems to miss the point that the, the, the access to the grammar school is by a test which you have to pass to get in. So it's not about parental choice because the school actually chooses the children. And one of the things they had to do when the system was up and running was to handicap the girls. Yeah. The pass rate for girls had to be higher yeah. than the pass rate for boys because they had to yeah. skew the system to get sufficient boys into the school. One of the things, one of the things we know is that the neurology and the psychology can you, can you cut does, the chase, not, yes, does not support testing children at 10 to identify some fixed level of intelligence. Sorry, okay. Lewis, I'm going to go so can you number. explain <laughs> your knowledge? Peter, well, I, OK, can I just make a small point here? I, I will tell a brief story, if the chairman will permit me. As long as it's brief. I, well, it's, it will be brief if you don't interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> if, um, Evelyn Waugh had a rather <laughs> difficult relationship with Randolph Churchill, but they were more or less friends, and news was brought to Evelyn Waugh one evening that Randolph Churchill had been taken into hospital for the removal of a non-malignant tumour. And Evelyn Waugh said, how extraordinary of the British medical profession to find the whole corpus of Randolph Churchill, which is not small, and rummage through it and discover the only thing in it which is not malignant, and to remove it. <laughs> and here is the point. We had no doubt before 1965 in this country a state education system with many faults. But the one part of it which was working, and I've demonstrated with, uh, with, with research facts that it was working, though people choose to say, well, it was in the past, so it doesn't matter, which seems to me to be Orwellian in the extreme. The, the one thing that was working in our education system before 1965 was the grammar schools, and that was the one bit we smashed up. No. We still have secondary modern schools in this country. They're called comprehensives. Oh. No. Huge, numbers, huge numbers of people have to go to them. They are, they are in many ways worse than the secondary moderns they replaced. And we should stop pretending that by abolishing grammar schools, we in some way abolished the secondary moderns or the bog standard poor schools which the children of the poor have to go to now. All we did was to make absolutely sure that the only criterion on which you decided whether you went to one of those schools or not was how rich your parents were. Peter, Lewis. Peter, Peter can I... Peter, the first point is, I know obviously it's quite a heated debate, but I think it is a debate. And so I think even if you disagree with what's being said, let's give the speakers a chance to put their case across. But what I would say about going to what Peter's just said, even if it worked in the past, the, the question I raised is, we now, we now know things that we didn't know before. Yeah. We now know that there are systems and approaches to education which can get even better results. So relying on what happened in the past and saying, therefore, we should take what we did then and do it now is flawed logic if there are countries who have a different approach, which is fairer, and get better results. Second thing on quotas is as soon as you start to handicap people to get your quotas, and this is the problem with quotas, it then begins to look a lot like a comprehensive school, right? Yeah. If, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to get a quote, if you have a quota of 40%, and because we know the inequality in the system means that actually lots of kids from free school models backgrounds won't hit that particular benchmark, there is a real question as to whether or not you are actually having a grammar school system. In fact, you've probably got the worst of both worlds because you've set up this school to be this academic elite school, but you have a lot of kids who may not get the support. So I, I, in many ways, if you have to have a quota to make your system less bad, it's probably a not a good policy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right, more questions. Have one from the back, please. Uh, there's a guy in a jacket, three from the side. Thank you. Uh, so quite a lot has been said about Buckinghamshire Grammar Schools, and given I went to one for seven years, a couple of things quickly. So firstly, 
Uh, I was benefited hugely by going to an excellent primary school because my parents could afford to live literally just around the corner. Secondly, they could afford for tuition. Before I started tuition, I did two practice papers. One I failed, one I got 100%. If I hadn't had that tuition, I could well have failed and not got into the school. I don't doubt that it was hugely beneficial for me to go to an excellent school with excellent teachers and excellent peers, but how is it fair that they were all at my school and not spread around so that everyone could have access to that? Marco Harriet. I, I mean, I'm, I agree with you about this. I think that the, it, uh, 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 I mean, I think it's quite strange actually that uh, Peter and I are actually arguing for change, and this side are sort of saying, you know, the, the system's great. We don't need to change I it. I don't think we are. I saying mean, I think that. the figures show that the system is not great, and that it's letting down the poorest, and it's hitting the poorest hardest. Um, uh, so I, I sort of find that strange that I'm saying that and you're, you're not I saying think that. Arguing but, for um, Melissa, can you respond? Yeah, I think we're just <laughs> arguing for a completely different um, kind of change. We're arguing for investing in all schools. We're arguing for putting teachers and resources where they're most needed. Yes, I but it's, it's, it's not just money. It's, it's, I mean, you said that I, I, did, well, I should go to a primary school and welcome, you know, welcome to the real world. Well, I did actually spend a, a week uh, sitting in a primary school in Hackney, actually. <laughs> And um, at that point, I, I came to this whole thing of education as a sort of um, an ideological virgin. I had no idea about the, the educational wars until I went and sat. And I only did so because these boys kept on telling me that they weren't learning to read. And I was so shocked. So I went and sat in that school. And I was appalled. I mean, that, the, that we imagine that our schools are, t are based on evidence. And I saw just sitting in that little classroom that there was nothing. There was no. It wasn't based on evidence. It wasn't I based know, on what worked. The point, the point but, you know, but can I just say I don't think there it is was an based on ideological war. whim. I, I as not think... doing the children the best at all. I don't. Right, Mary, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, so, so, <laughs> where to begin? I, I have taught in comprehensive schools. I have uh, taught teachers. I became head of a school of education. Uh, I, when I was uh, teaching, uh, after five years, I did an MA. I ended up doing a PhD in education. So I've got myself a strong research background. When I taught in comprehensive schools, I taught in um, one school where there were 63 first language spoken other than English. Um, when I went into that school, it was heavily stretched and streamed. Uh, I was head of English, I went mixed ability, I doubled the GCSE passes in, in that school because of good teaching for all children and the best for all children. When I went into that school, I, I had a, a, a system of uh, rigorous teaching of spoken standard English, which went into written standard English, into debating. But in that school also was the best that had been thought of said by black women writers. By, by multicultural writers, by, uh, by uh, the angry young men of the 60s and by other angry young women later that. It was a curriculum and a syllabus that made, uh, that made connections with the children and the young people I was teaching. And it was hugely successful and it was hugely beneficial. And I will not have this characterization of teachers and of comprehensive education, which has transformed so many children and young people's lives as a den, as a place where children don't learn, as a place where teachers don't work really well. We have comprehensive education has in this country been transformational and it remains so. Right. I'm sorry. Right. I'm going to take one more question. Do you think I might have a word in this discussion? Just look at the statistics. No, no, no. Sorry, it's, it's quite important because it's... No, the, I, right. I, don't, I think, no, no. I think, I think we're having a debate here or not. We're having a, we're having well, you're having a debate, a debate in which one side gets an, a long opening speech uh, and then... Uh, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> We're playing four to three, and, we have, and as far as I can see, just at the moment, we may, we may also, we, well, let, I won't finish what I'm saying, but if you, <laughs> I think a lot of people in this audience are perfectly aware of what's going on. You are preventing me from speaking. Oh. Oh. Ridiculous. We're going to have 90 seconds at the end. You 90 seconds. What luxury. 90 seconds. 90 seconds to, 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 to answer a whole river of drivel. <laughs> you you spoke longer than everybody else in your can speech. I, can I, I ask this lady here in the purple to ask the last question? Before we let Peter have a few words. Oh, how very sweet and patronising <laughs> of you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just address my question to the proponents so that you'll have a chance to speak. Um, 
the, you've made a lot of stereotype things to, to pander and to support your arguments. And the comments you made around black people in South London and ga gangs is actually disgusting. And I can assure you, as somebody who lives in a council flat, that you know nothing about black people. Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying, and I do want to hear it. So, could, can you speak up, please? Can you speak I, up a little bit, bit more? I, I can I don't assure want to you. Miss it. As somebody who lives in a council flat in mm. South London, that you know very little about black people or working class people. And so, uh, gangs actually only represent 1% of um, young people under 24 years old. So you've used this huge stereotype to support your, your, your weak can argument. You, can you wind, can Sorry, you ask a can I just answer the question that? I, no, the question I want to ask you <laughs> yeah. is why is it, since you value the qualities in grammar school so much. Why can't you work it out that you that this all the qualities mm. that existed should be for everyone? Why is it that you you you're focused on the the students? Why can't you see that a structure could exist for everyone? Thank you very right, much. First of all, um, Mark. I mean. My, my shorthand answer to that is that no one kind of anything can, can suit everyone. So whether it's a comprehensive school or a grammar school, it's not. I disagree with that. They won't work for everyone. Grammar schools won't work for everyone. They'll work for those children who have a particular ac academic excellence, which can, which can, if it can be identified, they can benefit from. But that is not to the detriment of other types of excellence. So we will have children who are excellent in other ways. And actually, what we don't want is to produce a cohort of children who are only good at academic subjects. The sort of labour market of the future will require skilled uh, workers who can, can build robots. They are not likely to be the children who kind of go to, to, to university and, uh, and sort of graduate yeah. from a grammar school uh, background. Right, we're going to go to Melissa, yeah. then Peter, then closing okay. remarks. Can I just say, I think Mark's at least being honest in saying grammar schools can't be for all. Unlike Justine Greening, our education secretary, who has said recently, grammar schools, we're going to create grammar schools for all. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. The Green Paper said schools that work for everyone. That clearly is not the case. They're by definition, not but for all. I have to say, I find there's a backward-looking view of pretty well everything from human nature to our education system on the other side. And the idea that somebody who can build a robot doesn't want to know, learn about no, philosophy it's not or to music, the detriment. I just think to They're not mutually young exclusive. At such a young age is a failure of imagination. But I do take your point that some schools are underinvested in and they don't have high expectations, and a lot of that is to do with poverty and inequality in our society, and we put everything on the school system, but the school system can only respond it to shouldn't be a value system where, gra where grammar has a higher value than technical that's the wrong way of looking at it and that's why we get into this kind of debate yeah I know but I can grab you they can't as long <laughs> As, as long as you divide children at 11 in the way we've done from 1945 and the way we do Bucks in, and Bucks in Kent, Forget grammars, Bucks will, and oh, Kent. No, wait, Forget grammars Bucks and Kent. will always have a higher value in society. There'll never be parity. Okay, right. Harriet, it was a, a personal question to you. Um, yeah, I don't even know at the beginning. I don't think you listened to what I said. I mean, first of all, I quoted. I mean, I think it's shocking. No one here seems to be particularly upset about it. I think it's shocking the literary rates amongst boys on free school meals. Uh, you don't seem to care about it. I think it's really shocking. I think we should be doing something about it, and I think we should be looking at how we teach literacy, which it's just not being done. Um, if you now, just don't forget, what is it? Over just under half of of uh, young people do not get five good GCSEs in this country. That is a pretty basic that is a pretty basic qualification. What do you think happens to that lot who don't get five good GCSEs? I mean, how can we say that this is a good enough situation in this country that we're happy with that? It's your solution. I said in my thing, which you don't seem to have listened to, I said I actually believe that we should take 
those things that are taught in the, how the things are taught in grammar well, schools and make them available to everyone, which some schools are well, already doing. No, some Harry, academies please. and some free schools are doing with great success. Lewis, then Peter, then closing. No, um, then Peter. No. No, 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 no. Lewis, speak, please. Uh, it's, is this closing statements? No, no. Right. I'm going to go to closing statements. Yeah. In no particular order, except it's the reverse order. Lewis. Um, what an interesting debate, and a passionate <laughs> debate. Um, I guess you should all vote uh, according to your consciences, consciences in, the, in the election. Look, I, I think what's interesting in this debate is that we still have not heard a compelling account of what the secretary moderns will do. Will they teach history? Will they teach philosophy? What will the kids, the majority of kids, who they get to schools, learn? And if there are things that they're not being taught, what impact will it have on their chances of getting good jobs and being able to compete in the global economy? That's all I'm going to say. I think there's a big question, Mark, that you have to answer if, if you support this policy. Mark, do you want to answer that? Well, I think all, all schools should teach and attain the, 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 the minimum. Um, as it's currently defined by government, the five GCSEs, uh, grade A to C, including maths and English, regardless of what that school is, regardless of the subsequent pathway for those children is to go down an academic route or to go down a technical route. You can't serve as a robot if you haven't got the, the basics I I in place. So to answer that specific question, of course, the, you know, the, the three R's or what, whatever you wish to term them, they, they should be taught. What, what we're talking about here is, is how... Some children who display some kind of um, um, excellence are nurtured, and why should you deny children because they, they, you know, they're in an area with poor schools and unlikely to get one through the comprehensive system? Why, sh why should you deny them that opportunity? And why is it within education um, we, 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 we argue and debate the purpose of, of, of excellence when in every other kind of facet of, of human activity, whether it's sport or it's music, then we can quite willingly accept. Well, right, no, but we can quite Mary. willingly accept that you need to nurture excellence and talent in a particular well, way. I, 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 I believe we need to nurture excellence and talent wherever we find that, and we do that <coughs> through so creating. Good. So we agreed. We do that <laughs> through having schools which are well resourced, which are well run, which have high expectations for all children, and where children of all abilities and all dispositions and all social classes learn not just from their teachers but each other and they learn about attitudes to life from children who are different from them who have different home backgrounds from them and can learn from each other schools are not just academic institutions they are the places where children and young people become socialized and we have to ask what sorts of schools do we want including children with special educational needs <laughs> Uh, and the final point is this, my final point is this, um, I, I'm one of eight children, I'm from a big Catholic family, uh, I'm one of eight children, six of us passed the 11 plus, two of us failed, two of my siblings failed. The experience of that has blighted their lives. They have felt all the way through their lives, even though one ran a computer company and the other became a physics teacher, their sense of self, their sense of self is blighted by that failure and when and when they talk about themselves and they talk about their abilities it is always circumscribed by that we do very profound things when we say to somebody at 10 you're not able thank you very much harry uh, i think i've more or less said what i had to say to this lady but um yeah, I, said enough. <laughs> uh, I you know i just feel that at the moment uh, we we are letting down the poorest who are most uh, dependent on schools for uh, aspiration and for a, a proper good life, and we're letting them down. And, um, um, yeah, I think I'll end it there. Thank you very much. Melissa, yeah, I, close I, remarks from your side. Okay, the first thing to say is Peter Hitchens is absolutely wrong, sorry, Peter, <laughs> about saying okay. that selection was ended by Harold Wilson sitting in a room being a, a Labour Prime Minister. Selection was wrong, was, was faded out because... All the research showed that it was unfair, that the 11 plus was unworkable, and because parents didn't want grammar schools. And Edward Boyle, the Tory minister in 1964, faced rooms full of angry parents whose children had been told they were failures, and that's why Margaret Thatcher was the person who closed more grammar schools, because they knew it wasn't a system that could carry on. And I think that's important for Theresa May to remember now. The second thing I'll say is to repeat, this is a quick fix that won't fix anything and it's replacing 
the hard slog that we need to make all our schools as good as they can be. There is an enormous amount of work to be done. Nobody on this side denies it, but it's about investment and it's about having a common system that we can all believe in and work towards, not this divided system that reflects our divided society. And last but not least, <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, if, Harold Wilson was so, if Harold Wilson was so determined to abolish unpopular grammar school education, you'll have to explain why the 1964 Labour Manifesto, and I quote verbatim, said, grammar school education will be extended in future. In future, no child will be denied the opportunity of benefiting from it. That's what you said. That was in the Labour Manifesto of 1964. Uh, they knew perfectly well it was extremely popular. Uh, there are anecdotal uh, uh, accounts of, uh, of, of, of Edward Boyle, who wasn't in favour of grammar schools anyway. Uh, being heckled in this way, nothing more. I have come up this evening with a large number of research facts. I could have come up with a good deal more given the opportunity to do so. Uh, the, my, my opposition has, has either disbelieved me or publicly doubted that what I was telling was the truth uh, or has completely ignored my argument. Uh, the, the, the truth is, and this is the, the tragedy for the children in this country who don't have access to private schools and who don't have access to those schools which you can only get into through catchment areas. The tragedy for these children is that the education system of this country, for everybody, and particularly for the poor, has gravely declined. The GCE O-level examination, which I took uh, in the late 1960s, had to be abolished, first of all having been severely diluted, uh, because the new comprehensive schools simply couldn't cope with it. The A-level was then subsequently diluted as well. There's no question about this now. There are attempts were made to deny it. Uh, the Engineering Council and Durham University has discussed in an excellent article by Jenny Russell, which you can all look up, called Drilled, Not Educated, in The Guardian, established that A-level A -level standards fell substantially. The idea that our education, our state education, our secondary education, any of our education, has improved since the destruction of 1,300 grammar schools between 1965 and 1975 is false. It simply is not true. And the principal sufferers from this are not people like me who can afford to send their children to private schools or who can afford to, send, to, to live in the catchment areas of good comprehensive. The people who suffer from it are the poor. And I have to tell you another thing. There was never any reason, apart from, uh, apart from a, 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 an experiment in social engineering, uh, dreamt up by a man called Graham Savage in the 1920s, who admitted in his paper to the Board of Education that comprehensive education would lead to lower standards but would make the country more democratic. There was never any edu educational justification for it. It is a huge, disastrous social experiment okay. which, has which has betrayed the children of the poor, and you can tell I'm in my peroration, which has betrayed the children of the poor and which everybody should regret and which we all, particularly those of us on the left who claim to love the poor, should act as hard, as, as hard and as fast as possible to bring to an end. Support the motion. Thank you so much. There's a bunch at the front, you should count it. I think we're not going to I'd like to thank all the speakers Peter, Harriet, Mark, Lewis, Mary, Melissa. It's been lively, it's been fun. Thank you very much.